personal and beautiful. Uh, okay, let me touch you for a moment to see what I'm talking about. Okay. Bueno. Ok. Bueno, eh, we are here in Bogota eh, with Vincenzo, the creator of the Now Technique, a eh, uh, technique that has impressed me a lot in, in my work with myself and with my students. and. And I asked him if I could make him an interview, and he said yes. So now uh, uh, I start to to ask you, Vincenzo, how did you begin being Vincenzo? How I, be I began to be Vincenzo? <laughs> yes. <laughs> How everything starts. <laughs> okay, how everything started. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With the technique. With the technique. Okay. Yes. The technique is the evolution of a journey of self discovery, of self understanding. I always had this inclination to understand what life was for me. And I have asked for long time questions to myself. Like a question, what is the meaning of my life and how can I um, experience meaning and peace and understanding. And I discovered that uh, it was important for me <coughs> to understand <coughs> who I was emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And I dedicated chunk, chunks of uh, periods of uh, research to the body, to the emotions, to thinking and then I discovered that more I experienced those aspects of research more they were all connected with each other so through the years I started to investigate how my physical sensations and physical reactions were connected with my emotions and how my emotions were connected with my thinking and how my thinking was connected with my imagination, with my inspiration, with my intuition, and how all of this together was uh, contributing to create a more coherent, more complete understanding of my life. I discovered that every time that I could reorganize my thinking and my feeling and my perception in a way that I would feel at peace and harmony with life, then I could relax and I could have a greater understanding of life. I then started to share this multiple attention with others. So I started to facilitate for others and the first one was my father when he was uh, sick with lung cancer mm. and I helped him to pay attention to what was happening to his breath from one moment to the next one. I helped him to become aware of what was going on with his body from one moment to the next one. With his emotions, with his thoughts, with his, with his imagination. And this little by little became clear that it was a possible path of integration. This is how the now technique has evolved. So you started in a way by searching your your own questions and then by wanting to 
heal and or accompany your your father yeah it's, yeah it's the kind of an act of of love towards the other yes an act of love an act of presence being present with my father in the moment in which he needed most brought me to um, gather from all my experience the essence put it together in a way that could give him relief and meaning to his experience and it was successful we had many moments in which he could release completely find meaning and uh, be at peace with uh, with this disease after that i started to facilitate the process with others and it has uh, progressively become more clear and more refined as a process and i have a deep passion for understanding what it is that makes the process working what it is that makes the process really relevant for the individual yeah for me it has been very relevant in my own experience uh, to learn how to really feel feel me mm -hmm. yes. I, I want to ask you now you told me you had a, a spiritual teacher that you learned a lot from a man who, who is already dead no? but he was very very profound influence to yeah. your learning could you tell me a little bit more about this person yes <coughs> his name was Jean Klein and he was a medical doctor who at a certain point of his life um, went to India this was in the beginning of the 50s and in India he encountered his teacher and he was introduced to a very ancient wisdom from India that uh, he integrated beautifully with his uh, understanding and with his sensitivity he brought back all of this wisdom to the western world and I met him when I was 25 years old and I spent time with him and I was introduced to this way of participating to life in a very open and appreciative way and you told me that you've learned some form of yoga that it's it's come from the ancient Kashmir if I'm yeah I'm correct that has to be has to do with these teachings of, of this master yeah he taught me two traditions one is the Kashmiri Shaivism tradition is a yoga tradition and the other one is Advaita Vedanta is a metaphysical tradition from India they both point to the same reality in a different way he integrated the two teachings in um, in a very graceful profound intelligent way he did not emphasize much the traditional teachings when i met him i know he did it before mm -hmm. but he synthesized his uh, understanding and his experience into something that we Westerners could relate to and uh, fundamentally he taught how to feel listen perceive and experience reality directly with all our being with all our body with all our emotions with all our mind without putting things into categories and without coming to judgments or conclusions but remaining open so that we can perceive life with the innocent eye with an innocent eye yeah oh, that's beautiful the other day you were doing a lecture and during that lecture you were talking about how how we get into boxes and and how we how we don't pay attention to our, our inner channel. I, I like that metaphor of paying attention to our inner experience or an inner channel. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I use the metaphor of watching what is happening within, like if we are watching a television channel. 
most of our lives as a very busy uh, social hands is uh, dedicated to paying attention to survival, economic uh, achievements and uh, social status and lots of relationships which uh, take all of our attention and very little time is dedicated to really observe what happens within, feel what happens within. So I use the metaphor of instead of watching a TV channel outside, let's watch a movie inside as it happens from one moment to the next. And I said in the beginning, let's start to pay attention, for example, to how the breath function in this movie that we are watching. Let's see how the body sensations are evolving from one moment to the next how our emotions are changing from one moment to the next, how our imagination is playing in this movie that we watch within, and how our thinking. So I use the metaphor of uh, watching the movie within because it is easy for people to relate to the fact that there is something that we can observe and that we can participate in that can reveal something meaningful and can reveal from one moment to the next one changes that unless we are consciously aware of they go lost. To me to return to the innocent eye, to the innocent observation, it is necessary to begin to pay attention to our experiences more we pay attention to our experiences, more we become appreciative of all the layers of our experience. In those layers of our experience, there is the fabric of life, the texture of life. So, the now technique is a metaphor and a practical, well-defined map of how to explore this inner fabric of reality. When, while I'm listening to you, I'm feeling like peace or peace and at the same time some, some inquietude. It's like uh, what we say in Gestalt, you know, I'm a Gestalt therapist. We say that we, we go through different layers, layers of experience. So the first one is like being in touch with stereotypes and outside. And then the other one is the psychological games. We play with each other. And then the third one is called impasse. It's, it's, it's a layer in which I'm not still paying attention to the outer world. And now I'm not yet in touch with my inner experience it's like a land of nobody there's some inquietude and so and the recommendation is to stay there and spend time in order to go through a more profound layer that you are talking about but how do you how do you deal with with the emptiness or with the void that we westerners try to avoid by watching tv channels or eating or i mean all kinds of stimuli, stimuli to, to get lost of oneself. Hmm. Well, the now technique is a education to expand the lens of our perception. So the breath has many, many layers of perception that can be investigated. The body has many layers of perception that can be investigated. Emotionally, we have many layers of perception that can be investigated. Our mind, with our thoughts and the images in our mind, equally. I believe that the void that, that we experience as Westerners, it's a lack of uh, appreciation for this subtle realm of perception 
that is available to us but to which we are not accustomed to pay attention. So we confuse the perception of something subtle with emptiness because we are accustomed to grab onto ideas, concepts, experiences, pleasure, pain. But there is a whole universe in between all of those. There is a continuum of reality that we are simply not sensitive enough, not educated enough to perceive. That makes me again want to, to, to think about Gestalt therapy. We talk about the continuum of awareness and, and what I like about learning from you is that you really experience and from a different uh, influences you talk about uh, things that I like a lot and you really incarnate those those values so uh, you were learning from an ancient discipline from your master you are you have you have been a seeker all your life as you said you you use your your skills to be with your father in his last period of life which also touches me because I also accompany a little bit my father and now you are very excited into neuro neuroscience and that is also something we have in common in in in, in the in the aspect of human humanism therapies like gestalt therapy and other therapies nowadays have been proven to be very good at working with the with the brain so something we did before in an intuitive way now we know it's proven and i like to learn a lot from you all your uh, skills on on neuroscience how do you link because you are an, a master of linking emotions and thoughts and mm -hmm. how do you link the ancient wisdom with the high-tech modern technology of, of our brain? Well, neuroscience is contributing tremendously now to un help us to understand more of how we function. It helps us to understand a little bit more of what we are and it's opening the door for um, a greater alignment to the natural architecture of ourself as human being. So I believe that the traditional teachings that I received, both of Advaita Vedanta and uh, the Kashmiri Shaivans traditions, were the experience of uh, thousands of years of uh, research from spiritual seekers who were very close to their nature as human beings. Neuroscience is simply helping us to understand how we function physiologically, neurologically and what is the base for our behavior the base for fear the base for aggression and defense the, bra the base for change the base for the transformation of something which is unconscious into something conscious I see no separation between the teachings that I have received and what I am learning from neuroscience, from neurobiology. I actually see that there is a very consistent understanding that as human beings we need to function with the understanding that the body, the heart and the mind are in reality a continuum. And that as long as we uh, remain open to experience reality with all our perceptions, with all our sensations, all our emotions, with all our thinking, then we have a possibility of finding ourselves as a whole human being and living an integrated reality. So neuroscience Neurobiology is confirming what we have always known. 
traditionally, philosophically, spiritually, metaphysically, that reality is one with many, many, many different expressions. In that sense, I am fascinated by uh, the discoveries that we are collectively making now that confirm that deep intuition that we carry within. I am one, you are one, we are one. There are infinite different expressions of this oneness and there are states in which we kind of lose the perception of that oneness which are usually associated with trauma, stress, pain, which we don't know how to elaborate. Mm. So going more to the technique because you, you when I met you the first time I told you why you call it a technique not uh, because you are such a poet and such a seeker uh, and technique the word technique for me is a little bit technique as as, as I said but really it's a technique in, in a way of the, because it gives you the the tools to really work with oneself so could you explain me like uh, uh, very briefly or yes. how how it begins the technique or the technique the the symbol of the now technique has become a butterfly Mm -hmm. A butterfly has two wings mm -hmm. and those two wings allow us to fly, no? which means to move forward, to transcend uh, the present moment experience which might be chaotic, confusing, painful and become engaged into a transformation. Uh, the two wings of the butterfly represent the pillars of the technique. One pillar is the understanding that in order to transform what pains us, we have to return to a state of fluidity, to a state of coherence. And this state of fluidity and coherence is really a physiological state. It's a state in which the breath and the heart recover a state of harmony. This is one of the two wings of the butterfly. The other wing of the butterfly says that when we are in a state of physiological coherence, then it's possible to use the skills of the mind to perceive and to discriminate and to link together different aspects of our experience into something which is more coherent and more whole can happen. So the technique has identified fundamentally those two mm -hmm. very important steps which need to happen. One, we need to return to a state of relaxation mm -hmm. and alertness mm -hmm. in which we can feel harmony beginning in our hearts. And two, then we can use the discriminative power of our intellect to investigate the different aspects of our experience and to observe clearly, to feel clearly, to differentiate clearly and to bring together into a coherent whole our experience. So it is a technique mm -hmm. because it outlines clearly those steps okay let me let me see if I understand it first of all it's we need a state in order to recover our inner balance in a way going from the stress response when we have been traumatized that we all have been traumatized in a way no we yeah. could say some yeah. people more and some people less so first to recover that inner balance and then from from that point we can start to work of what is uh, separated and yeah. try to integrate it or yes. integrate it. Yes, okay. exactly. It's a recovering a state of relaxation, which mm -hmm. is our natural state, and this corresponds to physiological changes. Mm -hmm. And enter into a different disposition towards ourselves. We enter in a disposition in which we shift from
from judging, reacting, rejecting mm -hmm. to our experience to be more lovingly disposed. And that, that, that sometimes is difficult in a, on, on a psychological way, no? I mean, I, I work with people and it has happened to me many times that, yeah, it's very, I know the theory that I need to love myself, but I'm, I'm pissed with myself and it's, it's a physical feeling. It's like, Ugh. so you help yourself with the technique to create like, a, like an inner change. Same. That helps a lot, no? Because when I, I do the technique or I feel better by touching myself, I, I can start to be more at peace with me. Exactly. We use a physiological mechanism which we call sensory motor and breathing appreciation, which opens the communication between all the parts of the nervous system. When this happens, the physiology changes and there are actual brain changes that allows for greater communication and integration of the experiences. So we walk from one part to the other, well, from the response, from the stress to the relaxation. Exactly. And it's not a relaxation of being like, eh, no, it's no. a relaxation that it also has to do with being alert. It's alert relaxation. It is called uh, autonomic arousal, which means that both the sympathetic and parasympathetic part of our nervous system are awakening to their functions and they harmonize to each other so that there is a greater alertness Mm -hmm. and in the same time there is also a greater peace. So when we are in a state of greater alertness and greater peace we can begin to look into the issues that usually affect us, to which we usually react, mm -hmm. to which we usually um, uh, that usually have the power to confuse us, mm -hmm. to make us feel helpless, insecure, and we use this state of alert relaxation to really identify one element after the other, how the experience is created in us, how the breath is responding to that particular state. Because you say that, for example, fear has a, a specific way of breathing or in, in each one of us. Uh, I would like you to talk a little bit more about fear because it's something very universal, no? That is very stressful, and it's like I relate fear with not being in the here and now, but being more like in the future. It's going to happen something. You, you told me that you have experienced a lot of uh, work with with your fears and with other people, and now you become friend friends with with it. How how is that thing? It is obvious, even though not too many to acknowledge it fully, that our lives are driven by fear. There is fear in the world, in everything that we see. As human beings, we carry fear as a response of survival. It's a very useful response. It's necessary for us to prevent us from putting ourselves in danger and it has been for millions of years our protector. Today, as we are fast evolving, consciously taking responsibility for our responses, learning to deal with fear is a very important and necessary skill. The way I have learned to deal with fear is by simply becoming interested in fear. And instead of trying to react to fear, I become interested in observing how fear works in me. So every time that I experience a state of fear, I ask myself, now that I am experiencing fear, what is happening with my breathing? What is happening in my body? Where in the body do I feel this fear? And I take time 
to become really aware of the fear. I take time to observe it, to feel it, to listen to the fear. And as I take that time, something in the brain changes. There is a region in the brain that starts to modulate the emotional response to fear. It's like uh, bringing together consciousness and experience. And as consciousness and experience start to first communicate and link together, they come together and fear transforms itself into into consciousness. into consciousness. It becomes consciousness of the present moment reality. My breath returns to be deep, relaxed. My body returns to be relaxed and alert. Emotionally, I find myself again open and well disposed to life. I do not imagine dangerous or painful situation and I'm starting to think that life is okay. Life is, in reality, rich. Now I'm feeling that life is okay in this moment. Being here with you, I feel it's okay. And it's good for me listening to all of these sounds of nature and being with you. I remember the other day in a lecture, you were saying that the ego is uh, uh, like the, the one that, that it's in between experience and consciousness, something like that. Could you, because I thought it was a very good, uh, very good description of, of the ego. Yeah, well, my understanding of the ego is that uh, it is what interferes mm -hmm. between my present moment awareness and the experience that is around me, that is happening here and now. So let's say I am here talking to you and I'm really interested in this dialogue. I have no thoughts crossing my mind and interfering with the flow of meaning that happens between the two of us. But if there was a part of myself that was, for example, afraid, that was anxious, that was impatient, my mind would start to try to manipulate my responses, would start to create a disturbance in my attention to this present moment. So my definition of the ego is that the ego is what interferes between ourselves and the experience of what is. Hmm. Now this reminds me to, to the movies of Fellini, that there's always uh, the, like the sound of somebody commenting what is happening. So <laughs> that's, that's the way, it, in my case, my ego disturbs by commenting what is going on. <laughs> so that's great. So we're talking about fear. And now, okay, first getting the relaxation response, so meaning getting out a step away from, from the fear and the stress. Yes. And then going very deeply, because I've seen in your work that you go very deeply into the trauma. No, I remember you first say, okay, what is not working now with you, or what is being painful, and then you make like a kind of a, a regression using the body and also looking for the his history, you say? The, mm -hmm. the, like the, the movie that we have attached to that feeling. That's, that's, I, I, I found it very interesting and very effective. That. Yeah. You, we usually react to painful experiences and we try to avoid to feel them. We try to avoid to perceive them and to understand them. My work so you say we usually uh, refuse to experience those things. Yeah. That, that has to do a lot of uh, with Gestalt therapy. That uh, At the beginning Gestalt therapy was called therapy of concentration. Like getting focus on what is painful. So you, 
sorry, I, I'm interrupting a little yes. bit because it's the plane and also I wanted to, to introduce that. Yeah. Okay, so we usually avoid painful situations. Yes. It is a very instinctive response. Try to protect ourselves from the pain. It is also a priority of our nervous system when pain is experienced to try to protect us from more pain to come. If pain is repeated, then we get locked into this protective mode. And instead of uh, processing and elaborating the pain that we are now carrying in the body, in the heart, in the mind, we tend to get locked into a state in which the only concern is to protecting us from more pain to come. That's when we are traumatized. When we are traumatized. Most of us are traumatized, either physically, emotionally, or mentally, or socially mm -hmm. traumatized. As the children of this planet, we are all traumatized in a way or another. It is necessary in order to clear the traumatic memories from the old system to re-establish a conscious appreciation of the body, a conscious appreciation of our emotions, a conscious appreciation of the way our mind works. Before we can come to really feel peace and love towards ourselves, mm -hmm. there are probably many layers of pain that disturb us, that continues to get triggered every time that there is a stress involved. Or there are situations which remind us of a possible uh, suffering which can be caused by external events. The now technique is um, using these two wings of mm -hmm. the butterfly, mm -hmm. in which one, we learn to find peace in our heart, in our bodies, mm -hmm. and then we go deep into the perception of our breath, deep into the perception of our bodies, deep in the perception of our emotions, of our thoughts and our images. And as we go deeper into this direct perception, mm -hmm. the brain begins to process all the memories and it begins to regulate them. And as a result of this elaboration and of this regulation, the memory is transformed into a fact of life. It's simply one experience in our journey of life. We return to see life as a continuum mm -hmm. in which painful things and joyful things happen. Mm -hmm. And our capacity to perceive is recovered. Okay, so if I understand, in a way, what we, what we try to do is to get tuned with ourselves in a friendly way by our breath and our body and then we focus on, on whatever is unsolved that it, it appears that what we say in Gestalt in Spanish is called situación inconclusa like unfinished business is called in English unfinished business so then we find in the, we focus on this unfinished business and with the body we track it track it down in order to see what beliefs are in that uh, unfinished business and how that, when it started, and then by observing in a loving way and being with ourselves, something happens, something transforms. It's kind of magical. The, the, it's, not, it's not that we need to do a lot of stuff <laughs> for fixing it. Actually, the unfinished business comes naturally to the surface of our experience. We don't have to look for. Mm -hmm. The cause, we don't have to look for. It comes to the surface as we cultivate a state of greater fluidity, of greater coherence. The body naturally uses the state of greater coherence 
to return to a state of uh, homeostasis, mm -hmm. to a state of uh, communication, optimal communication between the different parts. And whatever is in between the communication of the different systems or the communication within the brain comes to the surface and it is brought to our attention in a way that if we really stay with it, if we really pay attention to it, it kind of dissolves its energy, its content, its autobiographical memory, and it returns to a state in which we are simply this flow of life in which there is not much space for the past, not much space for the future. There is only space for the fact that we are alive. So being alive means I am breathing and the breath is conscious, natural, fluid. My body is here now and I am aware of my body. Now, when you were explaining me, a metaphor appear in my consciousness. It's like, like that infinite business, it will be like a messenger that is saying, I have something for you, I have something for you. And then when we pay attention to it in, into our inner channel, it's like, okay, I give the message, okay, I can go. Something exactly, like that. Really? exactly. I have, I have completed my function. I have used the energy to deliver the information. Now the energy and the information can merge into a flow of energy and information that carries all my past experience and all my present experience. So we can come back to the unity of consciousness and experience here and now without the contamination of our infinite business. Without the part of ourself that says, I have something to tell you, why don't you listen to me? Mm. I have something to communicate you, to you, why you are not feeling what I want to give you. It's so surprising for me always that I talk, I, I get to understand better what, what, I, what I've learned in, in a different, a new, a new way. So point in the two wings we were saying the first wing is to get in into like relaxation yes. rela relationship with ourselves the second wing is to to let listen to us and whatever it needs to happen happens but and you are very specific into different parts of, of listening to us like the or thoughts or images and or feelings, or body, or breath, letting go, what, whatever needs to happen, and what else then? Just go to enjoy life and go to it, or now, or what, the, what else would you like to add to that? Well, there is a gift within the human being that we are just beginning to appreciate, and the gift is called self-regulation. Self-regulation tells me that whatever I really become aware of, what I can pay attention from a state of alert relaxation and sustain that attention mm. to, for whatever time is needed, it will begin to self-regulate and dissolve. If I have pain in my stomach, mm -hmm. I can do several things. One is try to avoid it. I don't listen to that pain. Mm -hmm. Or I listen to and I want to do something like, for example, taking a painkiller, mm -hmm. taking something for the stomach. Or I can return to my breath, I can return to my body, I can listen to the pain in the stomach. And as I listen to it without reacting, without trying to manipulate it, without trying to come to a conclusion, to justify or finding a cause, but I just perceive it, just tune into it. The more I tune into it, more the exchange of energy information between the central nervous system and the stomach regulates 
the pain response, the emotional response, the all flow of the information, and through this regulation, the body finds its way and they return to wholeness. While I'm listening to you, I'm starting to do this, this movement that, that you use a lot with, with the technique. I remember you, you said it's very powerful or hard, not, not metaphorically, but really on, on a scientific point of view. Uh, could you tell us some facts about uh, our heart and how, for example, if I have pain in my stomach, it's useful as I understood to put one hand on my stomach and the other one in the heart as, as a communication? Yes. <clears throat> uh, we are now discovering that the heart is much more than just a physical pump, but is actually the most powerful electromagnetic center in the whole body. It also produces different hormones, which are very, they can be very beneficial to the rest of the system. What we do with the technique is to support the communication between the different parts of the body and the centering in the heart and the communication between the heart and the body is very important to establish the flow of energy and information that moves through what usually we experience as blocks, mm -hmm. as resistances. Mm -hmm. Because the body is the strongest electromagnetic center in the, in the, in the body, mm -hmm. to focus our attention into the heart establishes a stronger heart field which is capable of uh, um, integrating and leading the rest of the energy in the body mind towards coherence towards the coherence of the heart the fact that we are paying attention to the breath and to the heart centers reinforce further this electromagnetic field of the heart. Which feels very good. Whenever I put my hand here in, in the heart, and as, as I, I learn with you, I feel very... It's like the stress goes like down. Exactly, exactly. Because um, it's stress is often the results of uh, where we put our attention. Mm -hmm. If I acknowledge the fact that my well-being comes from being conscious of being here in my body, breathing, acknowledging the fact that my heart is the center of my experience, this reinforces the sense of being safe and of being at home and of being conscious of what I am. If I focus on thinking which continues to project mm. the possibility of more pain, more suffering, more fear, more danger, more insecurity, more um, mistrust, then I am fueling all this activity which perpetuates disturbance in the system. So it's all a matter of getting focus uh, on oneself and then uh, letting ourselves the time for whatever needs to appear, appear? Um, yes, I would say f feeling conscious of what is vital, mm -hmm. so the breath is vital, mm -hmm. the heart center is vital, mm -hmm. recovers a sense of safety, mm -hmm. a sense of uh, presence, of being here now, and then use the skills of the intellect to go and investigate precisely our experience, to see what in our experience is a sensation and where that sensation is in the body. To what in our experience is fear or anxiety or insecurity or joy. 
to what in our experience is an image that comes from our past mm -hmm. that tells us life is difficult, life is dangerous, you are not safe, yes. or images which are actually more uh, friendly, more loving, more secure. And to discover what thoughts are uh, driving us in direction of the insecurity and which thoughts are actually reinforcing what our heart already knows that life is in reality a meaningful coherent experience well it's very nice to talk with you i have many other questions to to ask you for example how do you apply this into our uh, world Huh? Because we, you, one thing it really impressed me of, of your teachings is you say, and I think that this comes from the Kashmir uh, tradition, that we are a universe of ourselves. Each one we are a universe, so we have everything. And how do you apply this work? How could this work change the world as it is now that we are killing each other and having mm -hmm. all of this <laughs> trauma? Mm -hmm. We are getting traumatized every, every day. What is your vision of, of the world? Yeah, well, the world is us, mm -hmm. each one of us, and as we recover a sense of safety and trust, and mm -hmm. as we recover the, the faith or trust that it is possible to transform trauma and suffering into a meaningful understanding, we are changing our individual reality. More we change that individual reality, more we bring it to the vision of the world a different perspective. And that different perspective is ultimately what changes the world. Is the fact that more people understand that trauma and that separation and fragmentation are just um, disturbed states but that our natural state is to recover that sense of continuity which we have with all life i don't have the ambition mm. of changing the old world mm. i have the right and the appreciation for the possibility of uh, transforming my experience and my vision of life. Thank you very much, Vincenzo. Um, I think we can let for other day the more specific training into the technique. I think we can find that at your webpage. No, that is called the now technique dot com. Dot com. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I love thank being you. with you. It's like. Uh, 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 being in touch with the relaxation, relaxation response. So maybe we can have a juice or something. Uh, a good juice. Why not? Well, thank juice you. and salad. And thank you, Jose Alejandro, for thank you, thank you, recording us and, and Barbara, the beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful. <laughs> My partner and assistant. Your partner and assistant, so beautiful. And co-creator and co-developer. And everything. <laughs> And everything. And everything in my life. <laughs> Kashmir. Bueno, bien, yo creo que está bien. Bien. <laughs>